Hi, Jim. Welcome to the show. Thanks for having me. My pleasure indeed. Very excited to hear about your story. And, um, you know, I know you've done a lot, Jim, out there in a lot of, lot of different businesses. And I know we're going to have a little bit of a chat about Shipper B, which is um, one of your most recent transactions. But um, maybe I could kick over to you, Jim, maybe give you, you know, you could give us a, a little bit of an intro, a bit of background into uh, to who Jim still is and, and how you got to founding Shipper B. Well, sure. It's a long journey because I'm old, you see, but that gives me a lot of experience. <laughs> so so I started my first business from the trunk of my car when I was in university. I was an engineer and wanted to design circuit boards, got a better deal if I bought two of them, bought two, sold one, then someone wanted a printer, then someone else wanted something else. And I eventually grew that business to a couple billion dollars in sales. And I had sold Sorry. it. <laughs> so, sorry, hang on. You can't skip over that so lightly. I mean, well, maybe you can, but I can't. So, you know, so we've gone from the back of our car to a couple of billion with a B in sales. That's right. That's right. That, that, okay. That, it, okay. it was an overnight success. Took 25 years. So, and, yes, and, yes. <laughs> and while I'm doing that, I invested in a number of tech businesses because I was selling technology products. I'd see technology uh, products and mm -hmm. I so I would advise companies and be on their board and mentor them and invest in them and the most famous one I did was BlackBerry so uh, yes. I was on the BlackBerry board for 13 years since before they were public uh, until 2010 and uh, mm -hmm. I founded a few other businesses I split my business once um, I had this engineering uh, design circuit board design company but I didn't have enough space with my computer distribution so I split that into another company called Connect Tech, and then that company continued and was profitable, and, and that company um, sold recently to a company called Heiko. So that was uh, one path that went in parallel with my original company, which was EMJ, which sold to Cynix, and uh, I had started one other one, Simply Clean, that sold to Pure Source, that eventually sold to Now Foods, and uh, more recently, oh, and then I sat on the board of this company, I retired, and I sat on the board mm -hmm. of Danby Appliances, the CEO resigned, and I said, oh, I can go in and run that. And Danby Appliances, we make about 2 million appliances a year. I started running a company. I said, that's what I want to do. I like running a company. I don't want to be retired. And that'll be my next decade gig. And then the ownership mm -hmm. group said they wanted me to sell the company. So I said, well, how much for? And they told me, and I bought the company. So that's a transaction that would not be the normal transaction. Um, that's how I ended up owning <laughs> yeah. Danby Appliances. And... Uh, mm -hmm. Then while running Danby, I see a need for parcel mailboxes because in, unfortunately in North America, people steal parcels. So the courier services, ah. FedEx and UPS, put the parcel on someone's porch, people steal it. So we designed a product to stop porch pirates. And then I saw the need for the courier business, so we started Shipper B, which is a courier business. See, I, I, just, I just have too many ideas to implement. Yeah, I can tell. I can tell. I love the term porch pirates, by the way. I'm so going to steal that going forward. So uh, thank you. Um, uh, out of interest, and uh, um, you know, and I want to get into Shipper B, but D Danby, um, w when did you buy that? I bought that five years ago after I had run it for about a year. So I was a professional manager, okay. and I was pre prepared to do that for a decade because I just like running a business. Yeah. And so I bought it five years ago. Um, which uh, and then of course the pandemic happened, but that was just uh, I, just poor planning or whatever you can say. What can I say? It happens, right? A bit bit hard to predict that one. Did you find business? Um, was there an uptick in business um, for, for Danby because people were staying at home and investing in their you know surrounds? Yeah. Well, that's interesting. Yeah, yeah. The pandemic's actually been good for us because we sell freezers and people buy freezers and we sell fridges. People buy fridges and people are even buying wine coolers because. They're no, it's entertained at home. So it was, it was an unintended consequence. Now, when the a pandemic first started, I was nervous. I'd have to lay off all my people. So, and we saw this shortage of ventilators. So we said, oh, we'll do a little pivot. So we assembled 10,000 ventilators, medical ventilators, in conjunction with wow. another uh, partner company and a couple of other partners. So, uh, but as it turned out, the appliance business is just fine and everyone's improving their homes. So it's been, uh, it's been good. Yeah, that's fantastic. That's fantastic. Um, so Shipper B, um, t tell us a little bit about this business. Uh, so Shipper B is um, it's basically a courier business that was based on using gig drivers and sort of a Pony Express. So we designed this parcel mailbox and 
if you're going to work, you might pick it up at the uh, uh, gas station near your house, drop it off at the gas station down the next exit. Someone else picks it up from that gas station, drops it at, a, at the home. So it's basically a little wow. Pony Express for parcels um, based on the technology we delivered to stop the por porch pirates. And it was a gig economy thing. Now that business in the pandemic was hurt really badly because all of our drivers resigned, not all of them, but um, many, yeah. many of the drivers were retired people. And they said, oh yeah, we'll make a few bucks. Uh, it'll be a good little side gig. And then all of a sudden they said, wait a minute, there's danger here. And er remember early pandemic, the theory, like people would say, I'm not gonna touch the parcel for two hours, right? I'm gonna have to spray it with <laughs> alcohol to make sure it doesn't have carry, because we thought at first it might be transmitted yeah. on parcels. So um, we turned over almost all of our drivers. And at the same time, most businesses at that time were not focused on their courier service. They're focused more on oh, batting down the hatches. The, you, know, you couldn't even visit yeah. people to make sales calls. Nobody wants to talk to you. Oh, you're just courier service. Don't don't bother us. We're, we've got bigger issues to, to deal with. So it hurt Shipper B quite a bit, I would say. Mm. Yeah, it was a strange time. I mean, I, yeah, I think I think everybody would collectively, <laughs> globally agree it's been a strange year and a half. But, um, you know, this sudden spike in deliveries, though, I mean, there must have been, I, I mean, we're still talking about it, right? Like supply chain issues and, and deliveries being delayed and stuff like that. Personally, I know we had a re couple of regular courier drivers. I, I was almost offering them a room in my house because I'm like, you're here so often, <laughs> you right. might as well just move in. And uh, maybe that has something to do with our shopping habits. But, um, but you know, all of a sudden everything became delivery as well. So did, did, did you see... Did you see a spike in those kind of orders, and then was there that you know was there a bit of pressure there on that supply chain? There was there was pressure because you're growing also at, at the same time you're growing too fast, so you can't hire people fast okay. enough, onboard them fast enough. And ours was an app based, you know, technology based, so it was causing our own logistics issues. So yeah. we, but we were when we started the business, I it was always built to sell because I had Danby Appliances, which is my main business. I was not yeah. intending this to be, you know, the next, uh, I wasn't going to take it forever. So we're building it to sell and it, we needed a big brother. And so that's what we did is we uh, sold the business. Yeah, fantastic. And and so what was the model? Like you, were you, who, who did you actually sell to? So we ended up selling to Torstar, which is the Toronto Star, which is a national newspaper chain in Canada. And that, uh, I was going to say, why would they so, buy? Sorry, I'm not. Yeah. yeah, no, sorry, and I'm cutting across you, but and, and I'll, I'll, I really want to get to the buyer. I mean, what was the business model? Who who was the clients for the business model that you were? Was it B two B? Was it B two C? Oh, How I did see. that yeah. all kind of work? Yeah, yeah. So we so we were ninety. <laughs> we were all B two C. So it's B two C and some B two B. So it's basically uh, you know pick up at the uh, clothing distribution center and deliver to the uh, home. So it was all all B two B business. Okay, so the the businesses were your clients. That's correct. And the end users were just often it was uh, retail products going to consumers' homes and stuff like that. That's exactly right. That's exactly right. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Sorry. And I was just trying to clarify that. My my thing is who who the uh, how it actually worked. So, um, so that's fascinating. And so, how many? Um, can you talk a little bit about how the tech worked? I mean, I'm, I, I guess we're all familiar with Uber these days, and you know, I've got an app and I want to go from A to B. Is, is it like that or? Uh, it, it was sort of like that. The driver would log in and say, I am going to this location. And then we had these hives is what we called them, the, basically the parcel transfer mailboxes. And it would say, great, stop at this parcel transfer ma mailbox, pick up 10 of these parcels. And they were all had a barcode. You just scan them with your, your phone and it would say, it would go green if it's the right one, red if it's not. And, it, and it had, we had a load sensor, so it would weigh the parcels and say, great, you took your 10 parcels and then drop them at the next hive. So we had two types of drivers. One we call commuter drivers, which use the power of while. What can you do while you're driving anyways? Well, you can take a few parcels in the back seat um, and just take them to the next exit. The power of while or the com commuter drivers, their big thing is they don't want to spend extra time. They don't want to drive into the city or into the subdivision and find someone's residential. And then the other type of driver was more like an Uber driver. Go pick up 20 parcels at this transfer point and then deliver them into the neighborhoods and drop off one at a time so th those were the gotcha. two types of drivers and some drivers would drive both because they say oh i'm going home but i may as well make a few extra dollars so i'll drive till you know drive till six o'clock tonight and then have dinner 
Yeah, okay. That's interesting. And and out of interest, I mean, it, it sounds relatively simple when you talk about the technology and how that worked, but I'm curious as about uh, curious about how, like how long does it take to or how long did it take to develop that kind of tech and I imagine it was probably an ongoing iterative process, but um, yeah, what what did that look like? Well, it's long ongoing iterative and it would have taken um, the better part of a two years to, I'm going to say, get it commercially ready. You, you, you start shipping in small amounts in a year, but it's not um, insignificant. You're doing all of the routing. You're doing the app for the driver. You're doing a portal mm -hmm. for the shipper. Because, see, you also have to tie into the shipper IT system. There's no shipper in the world that wants to you know, manually give you, t and actually we didn't even want to pick up 10 parcels. You're, you want to pick up from a business that's going to give you a hundred parcels or whatever. Right. Yeah. So, um, it, it, it was a chore to develop the technology and developing technology always has its glitches. And, uh, so we had a tech team of about 20 people, I think 20 programmers. Yeah. That's interesting. Yeah. And, and so, so the, I mean, where did the idea come from? Because you talked a bit, a little bit about Danby before. Was it? Was it? Did, did the idea come from an existing problem you had, or was it just something that you knew, you know, could be disrupted and needed well, a solution? So my problem is I have too many ideas. So I was sitting in a factory saying, "What can Danby make in a factory?" And I said, well, "Well, we're not a company that just makes appliances. We're a company that makes big boxes." So what's a big box? Well, I'm reading about Porch Pirates and say, oh, we'll make a parcel mailbox that sends you an email or a text when you get a parcel and and uh, um, and and someone can't steal it. It, it has a, like a car alarm. Someone tries to tilt it or break into it and that kind of thing with a camera so you can look and see who's there and a keypad so you could give someone a keypad to, to put something in. Um, and so in, in developing that product, we did a lot of research on the on well, tell you know how many parcels are delivered and how are they delivered and what's the whole thing. So we learned a lot about mm -hmm. the courier network. That's what inspired the idea. And the interesting thing is these transfer mailboxes, which we call hives, are essentially the same, very substantially similar technology to what you have on your front porch. The difference is it has ten doors, not one door, and it's you know uh, two meters by uh, one meter by one meter. It's or you know a little bit bigger than that. It's it's a, a fairly big locker that you would never have on your front porch, but it works perfectly in a gas station because they've got the space and, yep. uh, and whatnot. Yeah. Interesting. Very interesting. And, um, and so y you mentioned that you started this company and you were building it to sell. Were, were you the sole shareholder? Did you have any partners in the mix? So we did, uh, uh raise money. And so there was mm -hmm. partners. So we sold, uh, almost half the company to, uh, outside shareholders. Yes. Yeah. Okay. And so, and, and is that part of the pitch, I guess, when you're building a company like this, that you're talking to them and saying, well, listen, we're raising capital and this is what we want to do with it, but, but here's where we're going and what the, 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 the exit ramp looks like? Uh, yes, except at the same time, you have to be a little soft sell on that because you have to make the assumption you will own the company forever. So, um, mm -hmm. yes, that's the real story, but let's make the assumption you're going to hold it forever and build the company as if you're going to hold it forever because that's what you want to do. And we might have held it even longer. The pandemic didn't come along and take almost a year's runway out of the expenses because of the drivers turning over and uh, essentially customers being reluctant to put much focus on couriers. Even the gas stations didn't want um didn't want as much. See, pre-pandemic, if you go to a gas station and say, we will bring more traffic to your gas station, they said, great. It's, all of a sudden, pandemic hits. They're, everyone's in lockdown mode, and they, they, they don't want to think outside the box. They, oh, more traffic. We don't want more traffic. You're going to bring COVID. How are these drivers going to be tested? Uh, you know, what's the uh, danger here? Yeah. Yeah. I mean, it's, it's, it's such a mind shift, wasn't it? I mean, it's um, pro problems we never imagined we were going to have. So... Um, and so in terms of the business, I mean, obviously there's a challenge there in COVID. I mean, was, was the business profitable by the time you sold it? Was it, you know, was it still in that kind of growth mode or? No, it was still in growth did, mode. That... So, it, so it was not, it was not yet profitable. It was in, in growth mm -hmm. mode and it needed the, it needed the big brother for sure. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. And so is that what, that, is that what drove the, the actual sale then is to find I, that big brother? I would say, yes, it was. Yeah, yeah, yeah. 
So what, what I mean, what does that look like? That process. I mean, you're you're a growing company. You clearly have got an idea that you know is working. You've got enough market evidence and proof, so that you know you no doubt you feel confident about the business. But um, so you know you look at cash flow, all this sort of stuff. But what does that process look like to say, okay, well we need a big brother? What, you know, how did you define who that should be? Well, we first started looking within the courier business, so we went to other couriers to see if they were interested, and then um, the company that ultimately bought it had just made an announcement there they're going into the courier business. So we um, ended up exiting to a company that wasn't a traditional courier um, and was just getting into the business, and that actually works out great because they didn't yet really have the whole thing built. The problem with traditional couriers, they already had their whole networks. And, and so what we were doing doesn't necessarily give them what they want, right? Interesting. Yeah, okay. And sorry, so you did start telling me before when I rudely cut cut you off, but it's, who was the eventual acquirer? Uh, it was a Tor Star, which is Toronto Star, which is a national newspaper in Canada. And why would Tor Star be interested in getting into the courier business? They actually have... A thousand gig economy drivers delivering newspapers. They have trucks that distribute these newspapers miles. I don't know that they drive to your uh, home of in Sudbury, but they drive a long ways with papers one way and come back empty. So it really makes sense on loading on what they have, and it's good for their paper delivery people who can get more money. So it really was synergistic, and they were just a fledging fledgling uh, in the courier business. So. Shipper B was small, and then Torstar takes it and takes it to the next level. So it was very synergistic for them. They also wanted the customers, so we had acquired a few customers by then. Yeah, nice, nice. Um, and can I ask what, what were typical customers of Shipper B like? I mean, were they were they retailers as well, or is that yeah. most of them are retailers yeah, yeah. that sell e-com products? But some of them were just online uh, e-tailers. Uh, you know the hundreds of places gotcha. a lot of them were selling on uh you know amazon marketplace and stuff like that so they're you know small yeah. companies yeah yeah gotcha and and so what does can you talk us through what the sale process looked like um you know how long did it take who was involved what were some of the sort of sort of some of the challenges you've got to deal with going through that process so it it took about 120 days start to finish mm -hmm. and uh basically we went out to the couriers we went out to a few people and but we only ended up with uh, a few people who signed an nda or indicated a real interest and then early mm -hmm. on in the process one of those dropped out and then uh, pretty soon we had a couple of horses that were in the race um, which i liked because it gives you a little bit of tension in the buyer if you only have one buyer you're kind of negotiating with yourself so we had a little bit of tension in the buyers and uh that's how we how we did it yeah 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 no that makes sense um and and i don't want to tread on anything that might be confidential here but how do you come up with a number you know you're in growth mode i mean you know, for, I know with my, my experience, there's a lot of what different ways people can value businesses. And, you know, for established businesses, this whole multiple of EBITDA and all this sort of stuff tends to be a common approach. But if you're in that kind of growth mode, I'm presuming some of those traditional metrics don't necessarily apply. Absolutely. They, they don't apply. So uh, there had been a couple of other companies which had exited. And so we went for things... The, we basically build the comparables on multiples of sales, multiples of patents, multi you, you build multiples that make you look good. So we looked good yeah. on a multiple of patents. We look good on a multiple of sales. We look good on a multiple of parcels. Um, we look good on a growth rate. I mean, uh, you look at a, and if, if I take the growth rate and just extrapolate it for um, five years, then I'm going to be bigger than, uh, than FedEx. <laughs> Yeah, yeah, because you're growing from very so you extrapolate that at the same time you I, you try to paint a vision for the acquirer where they can imagine what they can do with this so when we tell to mm. sell to Torstar their geographic area was much larger than ours they've got underutilized resources they say oh yeah this is great we can utilize a resource which doesn't cost them anything because they already have truck driving there um, they already had drop-off points for all their newspapers, so they had a lot of the infrastructure that we that they could use in the courier business already established. 
Yeah, so. nice. So clearly some strategic synergy there where one plus one can equal three, right? Exactly, exactly. Yeah. And, uh, I mean, how much of that stuff do you know going in? I mean, you, you know, because I, I think in hindsight, you know, you can look back on these deals and go, oh, yeah, like there was some great synergy there and that's, you know, the reason this went through. But, uh, I mean, in the earlier stages, I mean, I guess other than what you read in the press, I mean, it can be a bit hard to come across that sort of stuff, can't it? Um. You don't really know. I mean, I learned um, from other exits to customize the approach. So you mm. learn what Torstar wanted and you customize it to what they, and, and you'd listen to them. So you'd hear, like um, one of my earlier parts, I'm saying, look, we've got all these patents. We're, you know, this is what you're going to need. And they, they, they're deaf to it. They don't care. There's no patents in the newspaper. They don't, they don't even care about that. So we actually ended up selling them the company and the, the customers and the salespeople and giving them an unlimited license to the technology, but we kept the technology. So, because ah, they, didn't care, okay. they, they didn't care about it, but then we cared about it. So that was one yeah. creative uh, thing we did. The other creative thing we did with them was uh, we also allowed them to pay part of their purchase price in advertising credits. This is a national newspaper. Danby yeah. is a consumer brand. We sell to consumers. And so yes. that again is win-win. They, they because they're advertising it doesn't cost them anything to add another page to their newspaper or put it up on the website or whatever. And and yet Danby benefits from that. So that was a unique yeah. uh, part of the negotiation. I try to find something that people don't value that we would value, and yes. or or vice versa. So we can give something that they that you know doesn't cost us anything, but the other side values greatly. Yeah, I, that's a massive piece of advice, you know. It's, um, yeah, I think that, that makes a lot of sense. Um, so I'm curious just about the technology piece. So you've kept the technology and they've got a you know unlimited license to it. But does that not mean now that you're maintaining that software and having to, you know, is there, is there not maintenance and management of all that sort of stuff and having to keep it to a certain standard for them? Um. So no, because we gave them a, a snapshot and unlimited use, and we're not going to sue them for patent infringement. So largely, what we kept is a patent portfolio, and a patent portfolio gotcha. is not necessarily the code or the code base. And we have actually licensed it to one other national courier, so we were able okay. to license the patents. And why does the other national courier want to do that? They don't want to get tripped up by some little startup coming in and and suing them for patent uh, infringement. But we're not giving them. Um, you know, it, it, we're not maintaining the code because you're you're right. That would be a a way to keep your losses going <laughs> and whatnot <laughs> forever. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay, so that's interesting. And I, I so and help me just understand this because you know this sort of maybe tech and coding for dummies here. But um, so you give them a bit of a you like the the software as it is today. Right here it is. You have permission to use this. Are they allowed to then develop on that and evolve yes. it further? Yes, or? absolutely. Yeah. They can develop it and, and change it. And they also took some of the tech people, which we wanted them to do. Because part of what you're trying to yep. do in Exit, you're trying to get win-win. So you want your staff to have jobs at the end of the day. So we did deals to en ensure that most of the staff were retained. And, and actually, Danby took a couple, a few of the staff also that they didn't want. So um, okay. it's part of... The way we're trying to uh, to do it because you don't want you don't you don't want to sell the company out from under the people right yeah no absolutely yeah it's um you know it's funny i talk to a lot of business owners and we're, we've obviously helped a lot of business owners exit and you know we talk about the different variables you know there's the or things that they need to consider and you know there's yes there's the valuation but there's the timing and how long you're gonna have to hang around after the deal and all this sort of stuff but but the, the one that often I see really wildly different reactions is around this, what I'm just going to simply call legacy, you know, which is, you know, people often think it's the, having the name on the door, um, whereas I sort of define it as, well, how do people think and talk about you after you've left the room? Um, you know, you've done this deal and, and, you know, I think a lot of people don't necessarily dive into that until it's kind of well advanced in a sale process almost, but... You know, hey, how are these employees going to be treated? And I guess it's a bit hard anyway, early in the piece, right? You can't prejudge how a deal's going to evolve, but it um, it can be certainly um, one that shakes people a little bit halfway through transactions, I find. 
Yeah, I, I mean, what, one of the things we did is we actually paid an exit bonus to employees or stay bonus to employees to stay with the successor company, which is win-win. Um, and yep. um, it's, you know, so that was one trick that we did. And I've sold enough companies and been with enough companies to, to gone through enough transactions that one of the constituencies I look at are the staff, period, end of story. Yeah. When, when I sold my first company, EMJ, to cynics, one of the part of the deal was I would be CEO of the combined entity for three years. And I did that wow. because if I'm CEO, I'm not going to go and terminate all of my long-term employees. And so I sort of kept that history going before eventually I, I left that, uh, that company, that gig. Yeah, nice. Yeah, I think that makes a lot of sense. In terms of the sort of stay bonus, was that something that, that you actually provided or was it the buyer that provided or a combination? What, what did that look like? Well, I, uh, we provided it, but it clearly came out of the proceeds. So uh, I don't know yes. how you want to say it. it. It really, it could be the, call yeah. it the buyer's money or my money, but at the end of the day, we put it in place. Yeah. And, and the buyer also wanted that because their fear is that they bought a company and on Monday everybody leaves. And it's like, yes, no, these course. people aren't going to leave because they're going to stay till uh, whatever because they're gonna, they've got this little pot of money at the end. Yeah. But in reality, between you and I, whether the buyer pays it or we pay it, it's it's all the same pot, if you know what I mean. Yeah. Oh, no, look, absolutely. Yeah, look, it's, it's I, I've actually had a few clients where I've said to them, listen, in the back of your mind, just keep, keep, an, keep a, an open mind to parking some funds or, you know, putting some funds out there for people to hang around, even if you had to take it out of the sale proceeds out of your own pocket. Um, I've also had deals where the buyers come in, particularly when they've been corporate or private equity, have said, hey, that next tier of management, we really want to make sure they stay and we're going to offer them some options and some, you know, give them a nice big carrot to make sure they hang around for a while. So I've sort of, uh, I've seen it come from either side, really. I guess it's always just sort of interesting how some of those things get structured. So, um, so yeah. And um so you said it, I think you said it took about 120 days from yeah. beginning to end? That's right. Yeah, interesting. And did you have to hang around at all or was there some sort of, what, what did that sort of transition and transition so, period look like? Well, so the, the beauty of this is I was only a part-time CEO there and everybody knew I was only part-time CEO. I'm busy running Danby Appliances. Everybody knew that. So it actually worked well. Now, as I have bought many companies, acquired many companies, I've learned when I acquire companies not to look at the leaders. Don't look at the generals. Look at the lieutenants. Look at the, the people at the second tier because they're used to working for someone. They'll work for me. When I used to look at the generals, they said, oh, yeah, they'll work for me for five years or they'll work whatever. Well, they mentally retire. They Many entrepreneurs don't hang around. So uh, I yeah. always look one level down is my experience. Yeah, that's, a, that's another great tip. Um, you know, for somebody who's been through this process and, um, Jim, you know, I think I see a lot of business owners who don't necessarily think about that exit, right. Until it's, you know, way down the track, even, um, you've successfully built a number of companies to a huge scale and, um, and, and exited plenty too. So I, I guess I'm just sort of curious in your thoughts around, you know, when you're building and you're trying to grow these businesses, like what are some of the key elements to, um, you know, do, do you always have that end game in mind and, and how, what's the sort of approach to that scale? Uh, I mean, of course, at my age, I always try to look at the end game because there's going to be an end game. I'm going to age out at some point anyways. But at the same time, like I said earlier, I build it as if you're going to run it forever. And yeah. at the same time, everything's always for sale. So if someone comes in on my, I don't plan to, to sell Danby appliances on Monday. If someone comes in with the right mm -hmm. price, then yes, Danby's for sale. But I'm not yet yeah. grooming it for sale or anything. I already decided that that's my next decade gig. And so I'm planning on growing it to that. Now, as I approach the end of that decade, I will start doing some things to make it, quote, better for a buyer to sell it. And and simple mm -hmm. example would be I'll, I'll simplify and get out of some of the, the little side business parts that it does that, 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 that aren't that make it an impure business, if you know what I mean. Some of the little yeah. things. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Um, and that's it. Yeah, okay, fascinating. And um, and I guess uh, part of the, I guess people listening to this podcast will be thinking, you know, when they see your results and you built it out of the boot to, you know, billions in sales. And, and I think, you know, Danby's 
of of you know certainly a very large. Um, I, I believe you, I think you're nine figures or something like that in turnover now. Is that right? Uh, we're about four hundred uh, million. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. I mean, massive company. What are some of the, the keys to success to growing a company like that, though? I mean, you've, you've mentioned, you know, focus on building value, but but uh, you know, holding it for the long term. But are there are there some core things that that go into building a scalable company like that? Oh, absolutely. I believe the larger the company is, the more the leader's job is to coach on culture and let everybody else make decisions. So I even say freely at Danby Appliances, I don't do any work. Everyone else does all the work. So my job is just to keep coach on the culture, get good people, and then let them do their jobs. So I don't micromanage. I just do some coaching from the sidelines. The other thing I often say is we have a culture of failure. So it's fail often, fail fast, fail cheap, and don't zap people for failure. Having a failure does not make us a failure. Not trying is what makes us a failure. So that also I think is necessary. Where I see companies that don't grow, it tends to be they don't take any risk. Like they're happy with the status quo. They'll just keep doing what they do and then maybe their market shrinks a little and whatnot. And I guess the result, some people say, oh no, high focus, high focus. I have not been high focus. As you can tell, what am I doing starting a courier company when I'm an appliance business? And what am I doing even, you know, doing a parcel mailbox when I'm an appliance company? Well, it, it just sort of extends when I say it's not just appliance, it's big boxes. Okay, then that's how I got around that one. How do I get into doing the courier? I don't know how I, I get into doing the courier, but. Uh. <laughs> no, that's cool. And I, I think, you know, culture is something that uh, I think we can all agree is just absolutely critical. I'm, I'm curious as to your thoughts here on this. I, I had a guest recently um, on the show who, um, you know, he was saying how, you know, the, the latest, I, I guess, thinking or you're always hearing people out out there in the world saying, you know, don't become emotionally attached to your business. You know, don't, you know, it, it's not you and don't be personally vested like that. You've got to treat it just like an asset and it's kind of clinical. And And he was saying to me, I'm the complete opposite. He goes, you know, I, I, and, and this guy's grown a number of businesses. He goes, I can't help be emotionally invested in the things that I do. He goes, in some ways, in fact, I don't think it, I could successfully run anything that I didn't feel passionately kind of engaged in and have some kind of emotional connection. Um, do you have any thoughts on that? I, I'm with him. Basically, I'm highly emotionally connected to all of this stuff, for sure. Um, I mean, the other thing is I sold my, my, my bigger business and I retired and I learned I don't want to be retired. I'm too young to be yeah. retired. It is the being in business that give me, gives me the energy, which probably means high attachment. And high emotional yeah. thing. Another, another reason I know I'm emotionally involved is something uh, happens, then I lose sleep over. I mean, I, I get, you know, I think about it all the time. I, I am passionate about it. That's what helps yeah. us be successful, I think. Yeah, yeah. It's uh, it's an interesting one. It, um, you know, especially when I guess family gets involved, and you know, I've certainly seen a lot of businesses where the, you know the father started it, and now the son and the daughter are running different things, and there's always kind of those extra, extra tendrils of potential emotion that kind of overlay it, which is uh, which makes for an interesting concoction. <laughs> so. Um, so you've been running Danby. What, what's and you're saying that you know that's your gig for the next period. I mean, do you see? I, I know um, you've been involved in listing businesses before, but is is that um, you know and is that a potential end game for for Danby? Uh, I could go public. That could be an exit. Um, I don't like running a public company as much as I did back when I first went public because I think it was a lot easier then. I think now it's gotten very legalese and it's just not. As, and it's not as easy. I mean, a $400 million yeah. company is no longer, um, I wouldn't say that's a, even a big enough company to list. Or, I mean, it's, it, it, back when I first listed my company, we were doing $68 million in sales. And they thought, oh, that's yeah. big enough to list. If you had a $68 million company today, I kind of say, hey, d don't get listed yet, right? And not only that, when I was running, yeah. my, running in the $68 million company, the a public company expenses were probably half a million dollars. Now, I, you can't spend less than a million dollars. It's just expensive to be listed. Yeah, it's interesting. It's um, and and welcome your insight here. But I, I've had a few clients say to me they were thinking of listing, and um, certainly were nowhere near as big as Danby is now. And but but put put the size aside, I was suggesting to them that they need to kind of have a look at themselves, their own personality, their own temperament, what they enjoy doing, how they enjoy doing it. 
um, said at the moment you're you're the king of the castle <laughs> you know you've got a very easy way to manage and move things around your business when you go public you're going to have a hell of a lot of compliance and you're going to be answerable to a bunch of other people you know do you want to live in that world <laughs> well well that's exactly right as soon as you um, go public you have you you have to sell to your public investors and of course you have to sell to your customers you have to sell to your suppliers so it just gives you one more thing that takes your time the other yeah. my other experience is public companies are often short term and i believe in being long term and long term gives mm. us a lot of power so i actually like competing with public companies because i'll make a decision that won't yield anything for 2 years and I'm fine with that. I, as long as I make the money, yeah. where a public company, they've got to make the, the numbers for next quarter. And uh, I don't have to make the numbers for next quarter unless, of course, the bank wants to shut me down. But other than that, I'm all good. <laughs> yeah, look, I can hear you. I've, I've worked in a number of listed large corporates, both Australian and US-based companies. And, you know, to see long-term plans that you've been working away on that, you know, obviously impact a division that you run and being overturned or upset for a quarterly result can be extraordinarily frustrating. I mean, beyond the fact that it undermines your long-term performance, I mean, it's very, very annoying. <laughs> so, oh, it, I mean, it, I think that has an impact on culture. Yeah, it, well, it, it totally does. As a matter of fact, in my previous company, I used to track when the quarter ends were of all of my suppliers because they would give us better pricing even though we were going to buy the product anyways. Like you, you nice. just hold your breath. Yeah. Oh, we're not going to order anything for the next two weeks because we know at the end of the month we can say, oh, we got this order. You want the order? Okay, you got to give us 2% off or sh free shipping or free goods or some marketing dollars or something. And invariably, they'd cave because they're public. Private company, I'll just hold my breath. You don't want to buy my freezer this month and you buy it next month. I don't care. I know it's in the quarter. Who? Why do I care? Like, buy it next month. <laughs> <laughs> Absolutely. Absolutely. Yeah, the freedom to kind of run your own way, run your own race, right? That's right. Um, Jim, I've, I've been really appreciative. I, I think I could probably do like half a dozen episodes with you pulling apart each of your your, your entities and your, your ventures. It's, um, you know, you had such a, a fascinating history. Um, I, I will put you on the spot in, in the moment and maybe ask you if there is one core tip maybe that you want to share with your fellow sort of entrepreneurs out there. But before I do that, I mean, are you, um, are you happy for people to reach out and connect with you? And if yes, so, I, where's the best place to do that? Of course. Uh, see, I have this little test. I don't connect it with anybody who can't find me on Google. But another tip is I'm very active on LinkedIn. So find me on LinkedIn and yeah. say that you were listening to this uh, podcast because I, I am slightly selective when people come and, and say and just try to connect. I don't say yes to everybody. But if you say you, were, you heard me on this podcast, then I'll, I'll uh, reply for sure. Yeah, cool. Oh, that's great. Well, look, we'll we'll put a, a link to your your various socials and and websites and whatnot in the in the show notes, um, and and obviously people can reach out there. Um, Jim, I've I've really appreciated having you on the show. It's um, as I said I think I could just talk to you for forever about some of your your background and history, and I'd love to pull apart some of these other businesses that you've run, but. Uh, obviously limited on time today, so thank you very much for coming on and and sharing your story. Um, is there is there kind of one parting sort of tip you'd like to share with everybody? The, the parting tip is the same as selling, and that is listening is more important than speaking. And when you listen, you will find what the buyer values and then sell what the buyer values. Don't sell what you think you want to sell. And that's just sales 101, but selling a business is no different than selling a product. It's the same thing. Yeah, brilliant tip, Jim. Thanks so much for sharing your insights. We really appreciate you coming on the show. Thanks, Simon.